Hello folks, uh, welcome to the Ceph Test Talk for January 2020. Today we've got Thomas Bennett to talk about Ceph for storing Meerkat radio telescope data. Thomas, uh, go ahead and take it away. Hello, yeah, uh, good evening. Um, it's, uh, yeah, uh, eight o'clock here in Cape Town. Um, yeah, uh, this is the first time I'm giving a talk like this, so I thought I'd just check. Uh, can um, I see this, uh, uh, Brian and Josh? Can, can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, I'm going to give you like a couple seconds just to respond in case uh, you can't hear me. But uh, assuming you can hear me, I'm going to start uh, sharing my um, sharing my screen. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Yeah, okay, I can hear you. Fantastic. Okay. So uh, I've just started sharing a screen. Can you guys? See something? <laughs> it should be a black screen so far. <laughs> yeah, we can see a black screen. Okay, great. Uh, play from start. Yeah, okay, cool. Can you see my, my opening slide? Yes. Cool, great. Okay, so um, yeah. Hi, uh, uh, my name is uh, Anna. This is, this is being recorded for posterity, so I'm going to assume that I'm talking to uh, uh, people in retrospect, but uh, um, so yeah, so hi everyone, my name is Thomas, uh, Thomas Bennett, and um, yeah, greetings from the southern tip of Africa. Um, uh, first of all, thank you to Mike Perez and the CEF Foundation for inviting me to talk today on the CEF, uh, CEF TED Talk. Um, uh, yeah, this is the first time uh, I'm presenting online, so it's, it's, it's obviously a bit uh, unusual to not have uh, people in front of you to see what uh, what kind of response you're getting. Um, uh, so just bear with me while I settle in and, and get, the, get the talk going. Um, uh, I guess if you have any questions, um, I uh, post them on the chat, or um, uh, post them on the chat, or uh, yeah, or just wait, wait until the end of the end of the talk. Uh, it's probably the easiest um, uh, because obviously I can't see any visual cues. Um, yeah, and if obviously there are any issues with it, uh, uh, the technical parts of the presentation, you can't hear me or you can't see slides or something. Please just obviously stop and let me know because there's no point in um, talking to you guys if you can't see what I'm um, what I'm what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. So uh, this is now my title, sli uh, my title slide, um, and uh, as you can see, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, I mentioned a few, a few words there. I thought I'd just kind of delve in a bit and um, talk a bit about the, the words I'm using. Um, uh, um, so yeah, so Meerkat is the, uh, the science instrument of interest here, um, and is uh, currently the most uh, powerful radio telescope in the world. Um, and then you see uh, uh, the word Ceph, and obviously that just makes sense, of course. I mean, why would you want to use anything else? And then, of course, there's radio telescope data. So um, uh, Meerkat is a radio telescope, and I'll be uh, talking a bit more about um, uh, radio astronomy, uh, uh, maybe a bit about the history of radio astronomy, um, talk a bit about the Meerkat telescope, and then I'll finally talk about some of the stuff that, uh, some of the CEF um, classes that we set up to use to, uh, to store Meerkat data. Okay, so just a quick overview of who we are. Um, yeah, because uh, often people have heard of things like the SKA um, and people have heard of uh, Meerkat, but they probably don't know the, the kind of relationship between all these bits and pieces. Um, uh, so the SKA project, or the Square Kilometre Array project, is a project to build the largest rated telescope in the world. Uh, it includes 100 organizations across uh, 20 different countries. Um, uh, the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, which is a bit of a mouthful, it uh, abbreviates as SARAO, um, is one of these organizations um, and of course, that means that South Africa is one of these countries involved. Um, so Sarao is responsible for managing all the radio astronomy initiatives uh, and facilities in South Africa. Um, this includes uh, the Meerkat Radio Telescope, uh, which is located in the Karoo, uh, a dry and arid region in the kind of, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, out in the, um, about 900 kilometers north of, uh, of Cape Town. Um, so it's, it, that's where the telescope is located in, in the Karoo. Uh, uh, we're also responsible for the, uh, the African Very Long Baseline Interferometry Network, or abbreviated as the AVN. Um, and this is a, an attempt to uh, include other uh, our partner countries who are also going to be involved in uh, building, uh, well, hosting the SKA. Um, uh, and those are so the, yeah, the eight, eight partner SKA countries in, in Africa. Um, and, uh, uh, and we also, this, the SRA also uh, uh, is the umbrella organization that, that uh, controls all the, um, the contributions and infrastructure and engineering and planning for the Square Kilometre Array Radio Telescope, um, all the design components of, of that. Um, yeah, um, 
that's basically who we are. So maybe that gives you a bit more context as to um, as to you know uh, uh, yeah uh, what the SK is and what Meerkat is. Um, okay, who am I? Um, as I said before, I'm Thomas Bennett, um, and here you can see it's a nice newbie photo of me looking proudly on upon my first two uh, nodes uh, that I installed Ceph on. As you can see, I'm a newbie because I've only got two nodes there, and um, we all know that you need at least replication. You need at least three nodes to uh, to start a start a Ceph Ceph cluster. Um, in its, in its default mode without reporting errors. Um, yeah, I've been working on the Mercat project for the last 12 years, uh, um, and my jobs have included uh, being a software developer, I've been a, um, a, system engineer, a systems engineer, and now, uh, in the last while, a storage engineer, uh, which is why I'm presenting here today. Um, uh, I guess we started using Ceph in the latter days of Joule, um, uh, with our first production cluster going out in Luminous uh, in about April 2018. So we're relatively new to the Ceph community, um, uh, but we, yeah, we are obviously hoping to uh, be able to c contribute wherever we can. Um, and um, yeah, at some point, yeah, we'll, uh, I mean, yeah, we certainly we've 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 learned learned a lot as we've as we've gone on. Um, yeah, so um, uh, cosmology is a science which has only a few observable facts to work with. That was um, a statement made by Robert Woodrow Wilson. Uh, he's an American astronomer and co-discoverer of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, and uh, it's always nice to include an XKCD in your slides because, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you, you, you can kind of pour over this and you can kind of look and you can see this. There's lots of little tidbits there. But um, uh, but, they just, but what I'm trying to illustrate here is that um, um, uh, astronomy for a long time uh, uh, concentrated on the visible spectrum because uh, that was uh, the only instruments that we that we built were um, optical telescopes, um, and it was kind of uh, radio astronomy that really kind of um, um, uh, opened up this idea that there was more to observe than just the just the visible spectrum. And in fact, in um, the first detected radio waves were from uh, from an astronomical object was in 1932. Uh, when Carl Jansky at Bell, uh, Bell, Bell Labs uh, observed radiation coming from the Milky Way. Um, yeah, so radio astronomy has played a pivotal role in kind of improving the few observable facts that we have to have to work with. Um, and I guess it's quite fun to have a look and just see what um, uh, what I'm trying to uh, mean by this. And if you look at this this photo, this is a uh, optical photo of the of the night sky. Um, I believe that that bright spot in, uh, kind of just off this uh, off the center to the right is Centaurus A. Um, and typically, uh, this uh, picture is shown in much much higher detail. This is taken from our Mirlich telescope, which is a optical telescope that slaves with um, uh, to uh, uh, meerkat pointing. Uh, and the deal with this is that you want to um, you kind of want to do optical pictures of the um, of the night sky to see where uh, meerkat's observing. Um, and, but as I said, this is typically, that's a galaxy, uh, Centaurus A, and it's, uh, it's usually shown in slightly high resolution, but the reason for doing this is um, uh, kind of overlaying that with the uh, a picture from Meerkat. Um, and this is now, you can see there's a lot more detail and structure there that you otherwise couldn't see at the optical regions. Um, those large structures on either side are, um, are radio jets that are being um, uh, created by the supermassive black hole at the center of this galaxy. Um, and so you can see, uh, as I said, uh, uh, Cat's now one of it's the most powerful radio telescope in the world, and we uh, we can create these really beautiful high-resolution images. Um, and so finally, radio astronomy has become a bit more um, a, a bit cooler than it used to be. Um, it typically, was the optical astronomers that um, uh, that had the beautiful pictures, but uh, we're starting to catch up with them now. Uh, let's just get this going. So here we go. So here's uh, just a um, uh, yeah high-speed on high-speed photography of what uh, what the dishes look like just giving a idea about uh, where we are as you can see it's a um, it's a, a semi-desert region um, and we're far away from any um, uh, radio transmitters uh, which uh, are obviously a big problem for us um, uh, RFI is, is yeah I mean yeah you know uh, is a is a big is a big problem for us so when you built away uh, from any um, uh, urban structures and um, uh, human activity um, and we also we have uh, government has passed legislation to protect this area so that people can't actually build radio transmitters um, in the surrounding areas. Um, yeah, so basically in 2006, the African government commissioned a team of uh, scientists and engineers to start the design work uh, for the SKA precursor telescope. Uh, this precursor telescope was intended to demonstrate that South Africa could not only play in the global SKA project, but could also demonstrate South Africa's technical and engineering abilities. 
Uh, the original telescope uh, design consisted of 20 dishes and became known as the Karoo Array Telescope, or CAT, um, uh, named after the South African desert-like region, the Karoo, in which it was to be built. Um, sometime later, South African government made um, uh, more budget available to build a bigger system. It then became known as Meerkat, um, a play on the Afrikaans word Mir, which means more, um, as in more, more cat. Uh, but it obviously refers to the uh, Meerkat, the small mammal native to the Karoo region, um, and famed for standing on its hind legs to view the world. Um, so as of uh, July 20, uh, uh, 2018, the Meerkat was commissioned and is now the most powerful radio telescope in the world, as I've said before. Um, uh, this will only be surpassed uh, when it's absorbed into the SKA Phase 1 telescope, which is going to happen in a few years' time. Um, so yeah, so it's, uh, as I said, radio astronomy, uh, we've, we've started making these really beautiful pictures. Um, um, the Meerkat telescope operates in a number of modes. One of those modes is an imaging mode, so it's always nice to show the pictures and show some of the stuff that we get up to. Um, and this is a, a radio image of the center portions of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it was used uh, for an inauguration image in uh, July of 2018. Um, uh, the plane of the galaxies is marked by a series of bright features, which you can, um, uh, which is basically exploding stars and regions where new stars have been born, um, and runs horizontally through the image. Uh, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy is hidden in the brightest of these uh, extended regions. Um, yeah, and now what we have never has never been seen before are the radio bubbles that were discovered by the Meerkat uh, telescope, uh, and these extend vertically and um, vertically out of uh, the top and the bottom of the of the plane of the galaxy. You can see those kind of like uh, bubble structures. I'm hoping that the resolution is high enough for you guys to actually um, actually see that. Um, so the two main ideas behind the cause of these bubbles: uh, the black hole could have been become briefly active, gobbling up lots of materials at once and causing a huge flare, or a burst of star formation could have blasted extra energy through the galactic center. Uh, whatever the reason, uh, they are probably the cause of the number of magnet uh, magnetized filaments that can be seen running parallel um, uh, 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 parallel to the to the bubbles, these uh, these structures over here. Um, and yeah, this is the so uh, this is pretty cool. So a paper documenting his findings was uh, published in Nature. So it's our first uh, uh, novel finding, and um, uh, we've uh, we've been published, um, which is which is great. Um, so just to give you an idea of the scale of what we've just looked at, um, here's the image of of the Meerkat telescope. Uh, you can kind of see the galactic plane running over there, I think. Um, no, no, the galactic plane actually must be running down through over there because what we've gone and done is we've superimposed the um, uh, the galactic uh, the galactic plane is up over there. You can see it over there. That's the galactic plane running through the um, uh, top right hand corner of the image, uh, and you can see that uh, the center of the galaxy, and you can see these um, yeah these uh, these structures over here. So this is just if you were to actually look at the night sky with radio eyes, this is what you would see. If the meerkat could actually visualize stuff. Um, uh, so going on with a bit more science. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, just like any optical telescope, the fidelity of the instrument is limited by the brightest source in your field. Um, the goal of, of this next experiment was to find um, uh, was to find a, a field accessible to Meerkat for the fewest brightest sources and the faintest brightest patch in the southern sky, uh, as opposed to the previous image. Um, what you see here is the is the last best image of this part of the sky, uh, which is part of the SAMS catalog. Um, and you can see the moon to the left uh, to give scale. Um, uh, so the idea was to observe the sky now for um, about 130 hours, uh, collect data. So it took about a year to collect all this data. Um, and the resulting image is what I'll show you next, which is this image over here. Um, yeah, I mean, what, is, what is truly amazing about this image is that you have all those uh, bright sources, which are these uh, supermassive black holes at the center of these galaxies. But um, uh, kind of in the background are all these other dots, and those dots are actually galaxies. Um, and those are Milky Way type galaxies that um, are uh, uh, um, that we've got data f that, that we've basically imaged. Um, and uh, uh, what is amazing is obviously um, uh, uh, about these radio astronomy images, images is that um, uh, uh, as you uh, uh, as you see further and further away, you're seeing further and further back in time. So there's a time component to this to this image. And uh, those small dots in the background there are, are galaxies. Uh, that um, that started forming uh, millions and millions of years ago, or billions of years ago. So, um, so the idea is that this image is kind of a snapshot of the um, 
is a, it's a single image that catches that captures the star forming galaxies in uh, to the early history of the universe. Um, uh, yeah, so in this way we can measure the evolution of galaxies from the early universe up until present. Um, so obviously this makes a cool picture, but the actual science behind this is uh, um, these two graphs over here. Um, and this is a plot of the histogram of the source count uh, by Doppler shift, where Doppler shift represents time. Um, uh, and the left is basically further back in time. Um, this has now been published in uh, uh, Astrophysics Journal. Um, so why the two plots? One is the different normalizations, one is Euclidean normalized, and the bottom one is uh, brightness normalized. Um, so the two bits of the plot where we uh, uh, are concerning the source count uh, is the, the boxes at the, at the, at the higher brightness agrees with the previous VLA um, data, which is uh, over there. And uh, however, the meerkat is more sensitive and, uh, than the VLA, and therefore we can see um, um, uh, past that uh, the previously measured data, which indicates, uh, which is indicated by these green boxes on, on the left here. So we have to see deeper and further back in time, basically. Um, basically, in a nutshell, this is the deepest L-band continuum image ever made. Um, so this is pretty exciting, and yeah, once again, this is a um, yeah, this is uh, now uh, uh, published uh, published data. Um, so this is kind of hot off the press. Um, uh, this is a another continuum image. Um, so uh, one of the modes that uh, that Meerkat has now supports is a 32K mode, where we channelize data into 32,000 channels. So you can imagine uh, it's a, uh, basically a uh, each image is a snapshot in frequency, and there are 32,000 of these images. Um, and what you normally do is you compress all those images to make a single image, which is this image over here. However, um, uh, as I say, we've recently uh, uh, started capturing uh, 32,000 um, 32, channels, and um, uh, this is a new mode which is being supported. Um, and what is pretty cool is we, uh, if you look in the center there, there's a, there's a galaxy there. I'm just going to uh, kind of zoom in on that. Um, and what we've done in, by capturing these 32,000 channels is we're able to uh, 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 resolve the, the, the Doppler in this galaxy. Um, and what it means is that we actually get um, a three-dimensional view of this um, of this uh, of this galaxy, and if you view it by uh, by by channels, basically, uh, we just get this going. You can see here that you can see that the spiral arms are kind of um, being being imaged, and this is basically uh, 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 Doppler, uh, and so Doppler represents uh, distance. So um, the stuff on the left is further away than the stuff on the right, and you can see we kind of iterating through the through the channel. So it makes it quite a cool video. Uh, but in your mind's eye, you can kind of see that um, you must imagine that the stuff on the left is in, in, in uh, the, is moving away from us, and the uh, as the galaxy is spinning, and the stuff in the, in the, in the, on the right is moving towards us. That's uh, basically what it's what it's trying to do. Anyway, this is what's quite cool about this is this is um, this image was created. Um, uh, uh, it's a fully automated image um, uh, creation, um, and the, uh, this yeah is basically kind of where we're heading towards is these uh, this ability to um, um, to automatically image these um, um, uh, uh, this data, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, SET plays a central role in um, um, doing that. Um, so it's also pretty cool. We got some. Uh, we've also got some mysterious stuff that we that we uh, uh, that we don't know what it is. And this is pretty cool. This is in the original SAMS catalog. You can see on the left there, um, and then on the right there, uh, it's kind of resolved with the Meerkat telescope. Um, and we still don't know what this is. This is apparently in the um, in the uh, in the local galaxy, uh, but uh, there's still debate as to what this actually is. I just included here because I thought it looked like a, a, an octopus, which seemed pretty cool. Yeah, um, so that basically covers the science that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, um, yeah. Um, so uh, turning to Ceph-related matters, um, so we have a number of Ceph clusters at Sarau. Uh, Name of the cluster gives some detail about where the cluster has been deployed. Clusters uh, co-located with the telescope are prepended with the name Meerkat, just to identify them as uh, clusters at, uh, out on site. Um, clusters located at a data center here in Cape Town are called Sierkat, and Sierkat is the Afrikaans word for uh, octopus, so it was a nice, nice way to kind of just uh, make it all make sense. Um, so it, it literally means sea, sea cat or octopus. Um, yeah. Uh, so clusters located in office are prepended with SWATCAT, so that kind of gives an idea about uh, where, where those are. Um, and uh, yeah, um, yeah. so you can, this, this table, I just want to give an idea about the number of, uh, what versions we're running. Uh, we're currently running, still running a Luminous. Uh, they did to some point upgrade this, uh, 
all of our main production clusters to Nautilus. Um, uh, I'm in the process of, of testing upgrade paths for us to, uh, to be able to move on to, on to Nautilus. Um, yeah, and to give an idea about sizes, um, our Meerkat uh, 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 cluster is, you know, just over a petabyte, um, and that's all SSD storage. Uh, and then we've got um, uh, our spinning disk storage. Uh, we've got our Seacat C1 and Seacat C3. C3 is our current production cluster. Uh, C1 is, uh, uh, is being decommissioned, um, and it's kind of a test cluster. And we'll, uh, yeah, we, we plan to do some experiments on that before we decommission it and absorb it into the Seacat C3 cluster. And then, yeah, so we've got some smaller clusters, um, including our, uh, uh, we've got the small test clusters, uh, which are, you can see they're measured in milli, milli uh, uh, pervy bytes. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so, so how we move data, uh, so we buffer data on, uh, on site at the telescope, um, uh, and, it's, uh, and this can then accumulate over a number of days if it needs to, uh, if we have uh, a link uh, break uh, between the link between uh, Cape Town and site, it means that we can uh, we can still the telescope can still um, operate normally. Um, and once the link is fixed, we can then sync the data down to our uh, 15 petabyte archive in Cape Town. Um, yeah, so the Meerkat cluster has uh, has two pools. Uh, there's a um, a cold buffer, which is where we store stuff to to sync down to Cape Town, and then we have a hot buffer, uh, just built out of SSDs. And the idea of that is that um, uh, this is for our imaging cluster, um, and so we co-locate our, our uh, GPUs with our Ceph cluster. So we have um, uh, a whole bunch of nodes with uh, uh, each has 20 SSDs and four um, four GPUs. Um, and uh, this last uh, iteration of 30 TK mode, we actually had some problems with that because um, uh, uh, the images and the and Ceph were grabbing too much memory at the same time, and so. Uh, the whole Ceph installation became quite unstable, um, and we spent a fair bit of time just uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, backing, backing things down so that we could get the memory management under control. Um, but yeah, so basically, uh, uh, data is generated on site. It's um, uh, uh, this this hot buffer then creates all these. Um, uh, it's the data cycled over and over again, and eventually, once it's created the images, that data is then um, uh, deleted because it's no longer needed. It's intermediate data for creating the the imaging. Um, um, yeah, so <clears throat> another important, important aspect is how our users access data. Uh, so our users log into our data service portal and authenticate using uh, SAML. Uh, once they're authenticated, they can search for the data. They can then generate a JSON web token, uh, which then provides access to an S3 bucket that contains the observational data. An observation is typically made up of a small number of S3 buckets, uh, a header bucket containing telescope metadata like antenna pointing and other sensor data. And then the data stream buckets, which contain data captured from the telescope and typically have to the order of one to 100 million objects. A user will access this data using bespoke data uh, access layers, um, uh, using a bespoke data access layer called CatDAL, uh, which lazy loads, loads the data. So this can be, um, so data reduction can be formed from your laptop or from a, um, a supercomputer. Um, and scales accordingly uh, to the connectivity and the, the number of resources that you have. Uh, um, so, uh, so typically, um, uh, this is kind of uh, yeah. Um, those images I showed you uh, that's typically generated by uh, by astronomers. Um, um, however, say we are trying to uh, build up this automated mode of, of generating these images as well. Um, and that uh, that that last continuum imaging that I was showing you, where we had the galaxy, I was showing the dot from the galaxy. That's all. Um, that's all automatically generated images. And so this is where we're trying to head towards, is creating these, um, these automated images. Um, and Ceph plays a central role in, in, um, uh, in, that, uh, in that system. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to, yeah, okay, so that's, uh, um, yeah, so I guess what have we been up to? Uh, we've forked Ceph metrics for our own purposes. We've actually stripped out all the, dash, uh, the dashboards and, get, and have got them working for us. Um, as lots of detail, most of the panels require a bit of uh, head scratching to provide some good information. Uh, but we're still looking to integrate uh, the SoundCloud IPMI tools, um, IPMI tool exporter into this as well, because uh, um, IPMI provides useful information that would otherwise be quite difficult to get off the system, and provides information while the host is down as well. Um, uh, Ceph deployment, we use Ceph Ansible, but uh, yeah, we're kind of looking towards um, uh, building our own um, uh, a deployment method, probably using Ceph Ansible or 
Uh, but we want to look at a whole bunch of other stuff as well to see how we're going to deploy going forward. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, that's pretty much what we've been up to. We've also got our data movers, which is all bespoke uh, software that's written to move the data to um, our cluster in Cape Town. Um, it's just a view of our Ceph metrics. Um, uh, yeah. Um, what you also spend a bit of time doing is uh, configuring our Redis gateway, doing a whole bunch of benchmarking to see what kind of um, uh, sizes we needed. Um, as you can see, I, I turned off dynamic resharding. Um, uh, we've been hit a number of times um, uh, by performance issues because when we're trying to reshard stuff and write into buckets at the same time, it's not 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 ideal. Um, so instead, what I do is I know I'm going to have these buckets with masses of data. Um, rather just uh, set 10 shards and um, and then um, yeah, our object size as well uh, to avoid creating um, a lot of shadow objects. We uh, we set our, our max object size to um, be 20 megabytes. Um, this is basically because um, uh, uh, we have control over how big our objects are, and so um, so we know that that uh, it's never going to be bigger than 20 megabytes. So it's it's an um, for for the majority of for 90% of the data, we know it's not going to be an object is not going to be bigger than 20 megabytes. So it makes sense to kind of tune our entire uh, uh, cluster to to those values. Uh, we did some performance testing, and we're pretty confident that we don't lose anything by um, by doing this. Um, so it kind of made sense, and so we. That's what we ended up um, setting. Um, um, yeah, I guess uh, Ceph lessons learned. Um, uh, we had a number of interesting hardware failures. Um, we had a bad batch of OS drives. Um, and uh, of course, uh, it kind of failed silently. And then suddenly, we've got uh, um, OSDs falling out because they can't log anymore um, and trying to restart, uh, which has been pretty interesting. Um, and this is the other reason why we want the IPMI uh, uh, tools installed, just to make sure that we can we get you know stats outside of the the, the machine um, itself. Um, uh, but yeah, ba basically the, the the lesson learned there was that don't use uh, cheap drives, rather use some uh, use some use some better drives for for the uh, uh, for those drives. Um, uh, yeah, we've uh, we've had some uh, we had some interesting problems with um, with the uh, um, uh, with uh, this is there was a in 12 to 2 I think there was uh, there were some um, interesting issues with uh, the um, uh, the uh, the dynamic resharding and not not um, uh, um, uh, um, yeah not uh, deleting sh objects when it did the resharding uh, well the index is not deleting indexes and so we had our indexes running on NVMEs and what was happening is these NVMEs were getting bloated. Um, and we're falling over the whole time, um, and it, it it created some really weird strangeness. Um, but yeah, we were able to once we overcome that and we sorted everything out. It was it was all, all working great. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So we we kind of all moved to all our clusters onto twelve to twelve now, um, and uh, the idea was to then start using the balancer. Um, uh, one of our machines is we're running the balancer was particularly under spec, and the basically we've seen with such a big cluster. Uh, with so many OSDs, um, the manager needs a, a bit more CPU power to be able to um, uh, uh, to be able to operate um, operate effectively. Um, yeah, um, we also had some fun with our Nautilus cluster. We got one Nautilus cluster in the office. It's running uh, through Proxmox, um, uh, but this is kind of like a Franken cluster, and we've got OSDs with 200 gigabytes uh, to OSDs of five terabytes, and it's quite interesting trying to see how we kind of tear this thing apart so that we can make it work effectively. Uh, with such disparate sizes in in uh, OSD drives, um, yeah, it was, it was a very interesting learning learning exercise. Um, but so far, I mean, we're very happy with Ceph, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I think we've we've made the right choice. And yeah, there's, there's certainly no um, no reason to uh, uh, um, yeah no reason to not continue using it. Um, uh, so just to give an idea about the OSD node hardware, we built our own hardware from from scratch basically. Um, uh, the idea was to uh, yeah, build a, uh, a, a node that suits our purposes. Um, what's interesting here, as you'll see, I've kind of highlighted the fact that um, uh, we have uh, 48 or uh, 49 OSDs, uh, so 48 hard drives and one uh, NVMe as, a, as for our indexes on each machine. Um, and uh, you can see our processing and memory, we, we pretty we pretty under spec. So uh, we have to really uh, we use OST memory um, memory targets uh, quite aggressively to tune the OSTs down to two gigabytes. 
Um, and from all the various testing I've done, uh, we've we've uh, uh, and this is one of the big tests I need to do on on Sierra Cluster One is we're at seventy percent full now is to take an OSD, uh, take a, a host down, um, and see how the recovery behaves. Um, but whenever we've we've had uh, this, these problems arising in production, we've I've never been particularly concerned that uh, things are going pear shaped. Uh, the recovery takes a bit of time because you've tuned a whole bunch of parameters down, but um, it still recovers, and um, yeah, we seem to be uh, seem to be fine. Um, yeah, so so far so good. Um, moving ahead, we kind of wanting to look at using EC pools, and uh, we think that this spec is we slightly under spec for EC pools. Uh, we're about to do some more hardware procurement. Um, and uh, we, yeah, we kind of we being more, um, agri we, yeah, we, we being more liberal with uh, our um, our choice of of of, of processor. Um, uh, definitely want to get that that up a bit more to, um, yeah, to run to run EC pools. But uh, to, to to know exactly where we where we stand, we're not quite sure. And one of the tests we want to do now, circuit C1, uh, before we decommission it, is to actually uh, go and create some EC pools um, and take some. Uh, Check some fairly demands and see how how the system behaves, and just see kind of uh, how under spec we are to get a an idea about where we should be where we should be he heading. Um, so outside of uh, Meerkat, we're also involved in Ceph community activities. Um, uh, we've organised a few Ceph uh, meetups in Cape Town. Uh, we've got a Gitter IM community. Um, we presented at a number of certain conferences uh, to kind of get better exposure for Ceph, um, and uh, yeah. Um, and also just uh, yeah, trying to bring users together to kind of uh, um, yeah, create a create a create a community. Um, um, so yeah, so uh, as part of this process, I went and uh, I emailed a whole bunch of people to try and find out who was using Ceph and well, how were they using Ceph. Um, so this is my slide. Mzanzi is uh, is the colloquial name for South Africa. It means the South in uh, uh, in East Kosa, um, and uh, yeah, so that's um, that's why it's SM Zanzi Ceph clusters. Um, yeah, and there's a number of organisations there, and uh, they all kind of starting to build up Ceph clusters. No one's as big as us yet, but um, but yeah, there's uh, it's certainly great been seeing this bit of interest generated in the um, in the community to be using Ceph. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, our future plans. Um, so yeah, decommission circuit C1 and do some testing along the way. Uh, as part of that process, we want to upgrade to Nautilus and understand the upgrade path to Nautilus and see make sure that we um, that that everything's still in spec. Um, and we've started the design work on our new storage cluster. Uh, so we've got uh, more funding to build 20 more dishes. Uh, building 20 more dishes, the, um, uh, the 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 data problem scales with the uh, by the square of the number of dishes, so uh, you can see we basically by adding a few more dishes, we um, we require another f at least 20 petabytes of raw storage. Um, and this time, I say we want to build easy pools, so we want to be quite clever about how we um, how we specify those um, um, those uh, uh, that hardware purchase. Um, and um, yeah, so we've got some uh, some really cool uh, kits at the moment that we're testing out. We've got some Optane that we're wanting to have a look at. Uh, we've also got uh, Tyne have brought out a 100 disk uh, machine, which is looking quite interesting. Um, and we have one of those that we're going to be testing. Um, and uh, we've, we've also got a whole bunch of super micro boxes that, we, that we're busy testing. So um, you know, if at some point we'll have a bit more interesting stuff to say about uh, 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 yeah, new hardware purchases and where we're heading. Um, yeah, and that kind of concludes my talk. Uh, so there's my contact details. Uh, Thomas at SKAC.za is my email address. Um, all welcome to email me if you have any further questions or anything more you want to know. Um, our website, uh, that's the web address for, uh, um, uh, in fact, sorry, I realized I should have changed this. It should be uh, sorau.ac.za. Uh, but if you point that, it'll redirect you to the Sorau website. Um, and uh, yeah, just to do a bit of advertising, there's a beautiful picture of Cape Town. Uh, that's that's I live. And that concludes my talk. Um, sorry, I think I see if, um, yeah. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please ask them now. I say, well, contact me. Uh, uh, you're more than welcome to drop uh, any comments or questions in the chat. Um, yeah, but it's that, uh, yeah, that's basically, that's basically it. <laughs> so yeah, any, any questions? Um, well, welcome to ask say tap me now or later or whatever whatever uh, is your hardware 
Yeah, I was gonna say, is your hardware like enclosed or is it open like in the picture? Oh, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> the hardware is enclosed. Um, and in fact, if I uh, if I go back to uh, uh, there was that picture of me right at the beginning where it's the, it's my newbie picture. That's 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 the chassis. Um, so sorry, I just I just put that there because it looks cooler having shown you the discs. <laughs> but yeah, the hard the hardware is enclosed. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, no. Um, uh, and we uh, we have a hardware at. Uh, uh, the Center for High Performance Computing, which is uh, they have a data center here in Cape Town, and uh, we uh, they've given us nine racks there where we uh, where we run our kit. Um, yeah. Are you going to switch to Blue Store after the Nautilus upgrade? Uh, uh, we are actually already on Blue Store. Um, oh. uh, so uh, yeah, so we uh, when we originally um, uh, yeah we were lucky enough that. Uh, we originally bought the NVMEs um, to uh, to do the um, uh, the to, to offload uh, uh, for the you know the um, uh, the writing head logs for um, for the file store, um, and by the time we went into production, Blue Store was around. And when we did our benchmarking uh, using Blue Store, we got just as good performance uh, without using the, the NVMe drives um, uh, for the for the writing head logs. And so what we'd end up doing is we end up freeing the NVMEs to be used as a uh, for a different purpose. Um, um, and so yeah, so we uh, ended up implementing um, uh, just uh, yeah, we have uh, all our OSDs have no offloading onto the NVMEs. Those NVMEs in every system, we've got two in every system. Uh, they are used to create uh, the index pool for our S3 gateway. We saw that um, the biggest bottleneck for writing S3 um, was actually updating the index, uh, which is updating the OMAP. That's a uh, you know you need to write, you need to read it out, append and write it back, and um, so that seems like a lot of uh, a lot of overhead. Um, and so, uh, uh, speeding up that pool gave us much more, uh, much more impact um, in terms of the performance of the cluster by comparison to um, using those NVMEs for uh, uh, for the for the offload for every OSD. Okay. I think you would get the same. Benefit you were talking about uh... DB, right? Uh, excuse me. Uh, Josh, you go first. I had another question about your uh, blue store configuration. Um, so you mentioned you were considering using EC in the future. Um, have you yes. considered uh, blue store compression as well, or is your data already compressed? Uh, yeah. So um, unfortunately, uh, uh, radio astronomy uh, data by uh, by definition is is noise. <laughs> so it's actually quite difficult to compress. Um, but that certainly doesn't stop us from trying stuff out and seeing. Um, but um, yeah, no, we uh, we we have the same problem writing data onto tape uh, because when we uh, Eventually, when the data gets cold enough, we we back it up onto tape, um, and uh, we try compression there, and we get no we get no advantage over doing any any compression. Okay, gotcha. If you had your DB for Blue Store on the NVMe, wouldn't that be pretty much the same as having the uh, buckets index pool uh, on its own set of OSDs? Uh, the bucket index, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I suppose, yeah, because um, you'd be offloading the, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty much the same thing, uh, except that we can now specify which pool it belongs to as opposed to which OSDs. Um, so I guess, uh, I guess by making them OSDs themselves, they, um, yeah, they. Uh, um, I mean, the, the one thing which I which I haven't quite figured out yet is actually how much of the NVMEs we are actually using. Um, and uh, because obviously uh, I assume the OMAPs get quite big, but they're not they're not filling up the whole. The only time we ended up actually filling up whole OSDs, uh, whole NVMEs, um, was when we um, uh, was when we had that uh, dynamic resharding problem, and um, the OMAPs were getting bloated. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, um, yeah, it's, I mean it's uh, yeah, it's 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 an interesting question. <laughs> I think you could use the the fuse driver to mount it offline to kind of get okay. an idea of where the OMAP data is at. Okay. Uh, not all supports yeah, it on that data. Yeah. Okay, that would be interesting to to check out. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, it seems like a fun project to me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for thanks for the questions. Thanks, thanks for listening. I don't know if there are any other uh, any other questions people have.
Cool. As I say, my contact details are there. Um, uh, feel free to uh, drop me an email. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for tuning in and listening. <laughs> yeah. Cool, enjoy the rest of your, uh, your Thursday. I must, uh, I'm, I'm gonna head home now. Have a good, you too. Cool, okay, cheers. Cheers.